In the presentation of the colloquium, the Treaty of Utrecht is said to mark, on the one hand, the end of religious wars and conflict in Europe, and on the other hand, the confirmation of European colonial involvement in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Indeed, the treaty spoke of the necessity of establishing peace, and I quote, for the perpetual tranquility of the world Christian world, the need for an universal perpetual peace, and for, I quote, securing the tranquility of Europe by a balance of power at the terms of the treaty. The treaty borrowed heavily from Abbé de Saint-Pierre, Project for Perpetual Peace in Europe, first published in 1712. Abbé de Saint-Pierre, who was present in Utrecht, argued that a confederation resulting from a contract and a balance of power among rival powers would allow, I, said, I quote, the power of Europe to form a, a sort of system among themselves, which unites them by a single religion, the same international law, morals, literature, commerce, and a sort of equilibrium. It was a truly political program with geopolitical consequences. It gave Europe the power to decide over international affairs in order to preserve a peace that could serve Europe's interest. One important feature of the treaty was to ask all European powers to forget the wrongs and damage that they had inflicted upon each other during the wars. Forgetting was necessary to enforce the international power of Europe, a power that was based on the idea that political powers could be improved by law and not just through power. From then on, European intervention in sovereign state could be justified with respect to the need to fulfill the highest goal, peace. But doing the good for Europe resting, rested on doing wrong to indigenous people and to enslave Africans. It gave a boost to the slave trade, and whereas between 1630 and 1640, 20 to 30,000 Africans per year were taken as slaves to European colony, between 740 to 1840, the number increased to 70 to 90,000 per year. During the European 18th century, inaugurated by the Treaty of Utrecht, 60% of the total captive Africans were deported. The looting of the world was also already underway. In 1710, when the Dutch left the island of Mauritius, the forest of Ebony had been wiped out. Europeans had started to build fortresses along the coast of Africa and were trading captive against guns, fabric, and China. African kingdom was disturbed. In the Dutch colony of Cape Town, 10% of the original Khoi population of the southwestern can barely survive an epidemic of smallpox introduced by European crews. On the east coast of Africa, European powers were keen to destroy millenary routes of trade and exchange to weaken the powers of city and network of merchants, such as those of Kilwa, the island on the east coast, which from the 13th to the 16th century had dealt its gold, silver, pearls, perfume, and slave with Arabia, China, and Persia, and which controlled much of the trade in the Indian Ocean. The treaty thus clearly connected peace among European Christians and wars abro abroad against non-Christian people. It tied up the construction of a Christian and white Europe with the colonization exploitation of the rest of the world. The Treaty of Utrecht also considered what were then the rights of First Nation, showing the European concern for their global order, deporting Africans to serve their economy, pacifying First Nations to ensure an European presence and working out international European competition with a larger objective of preserving European global interests. Yes. The presentation of the colloquium also signaled the 150th anniversary of the abolition of slavery by the Dutch in 1863. Yet the history of European abolition is is fraught with ambiguity and ambivalence. If it constituted the first transcontinental social and cultural movement, and if it led first to the abolition of the slave trade then of slavery, it more than often was unable to challenge the foundation of its economy, ensuring the prosperity of Europe and North America, thanks to bonded and forced labor, to looting and spoliation. Being able to do so would have meant taking further the reflection on slavery and its place and role in the European-dominated world's economy, which inevitably required the organization of forced labor. 
Since its inception, the exploitation of colonies had shown a taste for bonded labor, first through the enslavement of indigenous people, then with European indentured workers, and finally with African slaves. Further, though the courage and determination of many European abolitionists cannot be dismissed, their hesitation in challenging colonization as a project that could survive slavery led them to support post-slavery colonialism in the name of anti-slavery. The suppression of the Atlantic slave trafficking was, as Robin Blackburn has remarked, and I quote, central to the Pax Britannica, when Lord Palmerston, as Foreign Secretary, negotiated a free trade agreement with an Atlantic state, he invariably accompanied it with a treaty banning slave trading. I have explored elsewhere the complicity of French abolitionism with French colonial politics in the mid-19th century and the relation between the abolition of slavery and the introduction of forced labor throughout all French colonies. In fact, when you look, sometimes forced labor is introduced even before the abolition of slavery. So to prepare, you know, what will follow afterwards. And usually also the French, <coughs> excuse me, could establish slavery and enforce forced labor in the same movement, like in Madagascar, for instance, in 1896. Hence, revisiting the Treaty of Utrecht provide one more opportunity to question the Eurocentric cartography of history, which imposed both a Europe constructed on a Western axis, because, as we noted, even in the Treaty of Utrecht, it's a Europe which is, um, <clears throat> you, um, you know, Germany, uh, France and England is barely include the east of Europe or its south of its north. So what we call Europe is already a tiny part of Europe. And so both of you are constructed on a western axis and a world organized around Europe. And it's also invited to revisit the long history of European colonization, its configuration and reconfiguration, its mutation and transformation. Slave trade and slavery are now illegal everywhere in the world, and yet, looking at data, one must acknowledge the pervasive presence of situations that amount to human trafficking, forced labor, and slavery. Today, close to 27 million people are victims of forced labor, trafficking, and slavery. What is, so, effectively, beyond the humanitarian scandals that international organizations and NGOs have been denouncing, what is important perhaps to look at is the pervasive presence of bonded labor that points to the necessity for our current economy of maintaining form of enslavement to preserve a way of life. It is this bonded part in the process of production of the good we consume every day that brings to light echoes between the predatory economy of colonial slavery and current predatory form of capitalist economy. Or, in the word of David Bryan Davis, and I quote, Atlantic slave system foreshadowed many features of our modern economy, global economy. International investment of capital in distant colonial region, where low-cost, highly productive gang labor by slave produce commodities for a transatlantic market, and we could say global market. However, the connection between, on the one hand, the demand for manufactured goods, precious wood, precious stone, extraction of mineral, or the construction of palace and fortress, and in, on the other, the necessity to enslave is not specific to colonial slavery. What became specific with colonial slavery was that it led to the organization of a global scale of a racialized and gender workforce that was indispensable in creating the prosperity of Europe and the New World. It also shaped a consumer mentality among the masses of Europe and North America that inevitably brought at distance the ways in which goods were produced. A division was slowly established between consumer and producer, between producing country and consuming country. As sugar, rum, tobacco, coffee, cotton became mass consumed, the demand for cheaper price increased, and as a consequence, the slave trade and slavery increased. Further, at the beginning of the 18th century, colonial slavery consolidated a color line separating the world and the free of the free and white men from the world of the enslaved and black men. Colonial slavery racialized human so as to turn them into commodity. It led to wars between rival colonial powers, to a geopolitical of inequality, to the rearrangement of frontiers, and to the cultural and scientific enterprise of endancing the world. It's also encouraged progress in naval industry and maritime navigation. 
In the world of culture, it deeply affected European sociability and the art of living. It triggered the opening of coffee houses, of tobacco shops, the introduction of exotic and tropical fruits and woods, of exotic and tropical color in design, the introduction of natural dyes, the link made between tobacco and masculinity, between sugar and femininity, and the figure of the black over the Zen slave in literature and art. A, a, a domain in that old you know, re reorganization of the world need also to be explored more fully, namely the impact, impact of the slave trade and slavery on the environment, on science, and on vernacular knowledge. Indeed, colonial slavery had not only an impact on geography, economy, and the image of you, that Europe has of itself and on race, but also on nature. Forests were destroyed to create large fields of sugar cane, tobacco, and cotton. River, rivers were rerouted, and in the colony, cities and roadways set up to answer to the need of the colonial economy. Colonial slavery brought about a vast and European law led movement of plants and knowledge across continent of ocean, even though we need to recognize the agency of African indigenous people in this global exchange of knowledge. Colonization meant putting the European mark on continent, people, and nature. They name everything, rivers, mountains, flowers, birds, plants, fruits, and people. This first movement of colonization went thus with indexing all living things, seeking transparency and mastery. After geography, botany was the most highly funded science in the last 17th and 18th century. The technology of collection, both material and intellectual, extended the imperial power of the European nation, and slavers participated in that movement, for instance, Richard Ligon did not only ship from the coast of Africa Negroes, horses, and cattle for selling them in Barbados, but also rosemary, parsley, garlic, cabbage, and turnips. Plants were used as money in slave trading, like manioc and tobacco. And the idea of a global commons, there for the taking, apply only to nature and resources outside of Europe. And European trading company and state claim exclusive rights to the natural resources of the territory they could or the military. Mercantilism, the economic theory of colonial slavery, flourished through the fecund coupling of naval prowess to natural history. For Africa, colonial slavery meant the organization of mass kidnapping and wars on a large scale. Slave traders interfered in international politics, internal politics, sorry, supporting this or that king to encourage rivalry and competition and to increase the possibility of wars, and thus of the number of captives. Wars led to a decrease in local workforce, which itself led to famine, and to more men and women being made captive. Raids depleted rural areas of a vital segment of the labor force, thereby disrupting agricultural production. The forced exodus also aggravated demand for food in the port where slaves were held before in Borkation, and this resulted in chronic food shortage. When famines occur in Africa and the land ability to support people collapse, more were cast into Atlantic slavery. The massive manhunt encouraged the economy of predation, itself supported by the massive introduction of weapons in Africa. The cartography of the African continent was deeply affected by the slave trade. Road linking the interland to port, cities destroyed, borders being moved, new crop introduced to serve the economy of trafficking, factories to train future slaves, new social and cultural distinction, new form of consumption, and lives that did not matter. In this continuous cycle of cruelty and violence, lives became more vulnerable and precarious. As Catherine Kokrividrovich has noted, between the beginning of the 15th century to the end of the 19th century, the African continent was the only continent in the world that did not see an increase in its population. According to African scholars such as Ibrahim Atiyoub and Joseph Kizerbo, that cartography continues to imprint current economy of predation in Africa. Lives that do not matter, extraction of resources that do not produce local development, class of intermediaries that collect their dues in exchange for policing their population. In the colonies, the enslaved body was tortured, maimed, and killed in an incessant display of death and violence. It was sexualized, gender, and racialized in ways that transform African and black identities. If the slave ship was a slaughterhouse, blood, filth, misery, and disease, the plantation was a scene of arbitrary power. Testimony abound, <coughs> abound on the swift and bloody repression of marooning of revolt and insurrection. 
The objective was to reign through fear, submission, and terror. And it succeeded to some extent. The connection between a European way of life and bonded labor continued long after the abolition of the slave trade and of slavery. Indeed, European demands continue to justify the increase in human trafficking and bonded labor. Every time Europe took a fancy in a product, slave trade and slavery increased somewhere in the world. Thus, when pearls came into fashion at the beginning of the 20th century, it generated a huge demand for bonded labor and trafficking and led to a big increase in the importation of slaves from East Africa into the Gulf Emirate, where a huge deposit of pearls had been found. And similar elements emerged, leaking slavery in the Gulf Emirate in, at the beginning of the 20th century, even as late as 1910-1920, with colonial slavery. A racialization of the enslaved, rules about the marriage, family, condition of work, and denial of rights. Colonial slavery raised then the following question. In which way are the world we inhabit been constructed on the transformation of human beings into commodity and to which extent? It's also raised a question as to the meaning of colonization as a continuous enterprise, immediately new social and cultural norm, so as to expand man's domination on the world, human, natural, and mineral. The energy spent for this enterprise is phenomenal and deserves to be fully explored if we wish to understand its hold on human society. It has become a social and cultural model that is no longer exclusive to the West. There is no decline in this pattern. Good product produced for mass consumption still requires a part of bonded labor. Condemning colonial slavery is as fine, only, however, if it leads to explore current predatory economy. As, Ralph Michel, as Michel Ralph Trujillo has written, the denunciation of slavery in the presentist mode is easy. Slavery was bad, most of us would agree. To condone slavery alone is the easy way out. What needs to be denounced is much less slavery than the racist present which representation of slavery has produced. Indeed, one of the slavery long-term effect has been a widespread contempt and even racist hatred for people of African descent. And let me go back very quickly on this creation of the global color line. Though the case of the United States and England and English colony like Australia and New Zealand have been explored for a while now, less is known of the way in which whiteness was contracted in any other European country. And I will say two words about the French case. On July 13, 15, the King of France declared that the soil of France frees the slave that touches it. Same thing happened also in England. In uh, 1685, the Code Noir had set a series of provisions to go the, the lives of the enslaved in the French colony. What to do with the African who were living in France? At the beginning of the 17th century, between 5,000 and 7,000 Africans were living in France, mostly in Paris, occupying different positions as slave, domestic workers, craftsmen, tailors, seamstress, musicians, and so on. Slave owners were also used to bring slaves with them. In 1694, the first limitation on the entry and slave were, issues, were issued. In October 1716, new provision limited more severely the entry of slaves, and for the first time, marriage between black and white was forbidden. A slow shift began that made being black and being enslaved synonym. In August 1777, the police des Noirs was created which forbade the entry of any black, free or enslaved in France. Color became the fundamental marker. Freed black or Métis had to carry a permit without which they were imprisoned in barracks set up in every French port until they were expelled to a colony regardless of their wish to remain or to leave. And in April 1778, marriage between black and white was rigorously forbidden in France. In the King letter patent, black were said to be guilty of bringing disorder in the French cities and of you know, bringing contaminated ideas of liberty and equality. I mean, we, the black in question were just, as I say, 7,000 in France, right? They were not that many, but they were so much a threat that effectively all these decisions have to be taken. The decision to exclude them was taken effectively to protect the social and racial order in France and in the colony. The French Revolution abolished the provision, like they abolished slavery, 
but both were re-established by Napoleon in March 1802, along with slavery, because as we know, France is the only country that you know, had two abolition of slavery, one in 1794 and one, the final, definitive one, in 1848. It is interesting to note that in France, abolitionism was never a mass movement, and an until today progressive movement cannot fully revisit their colonial past. French law created a color line that was masked by the rhetoric that made France the land of human rights, reinforced later by the rhetoric that promoted, that promoted its civilizing mission. If there were no slaves in France, slavery in the colony could be seen as an aberration. The color line in France affected social movement and protest. Hence, the decline of sugar imported for the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which in the 18th century, you know, provided more than half of the sugar consumed in all Europe, and speculation on sugar price triggered popular riots in Paris in January 1792, not to support the slave uprising, but to demand access to sugar, which by then was allowing the poor to survive through the day until their evening meal. The color line was both national and international, and the nationalized color line obscured the way in which colonial slavery and colonial empire had connecting events in the metropole with events in the colony and vice versa. Protests against colonial product could be selective because the interests of the white working class, the emerging working class, had to be taken into account. And I, I, I quote now, you know, Catherine Pimley, uh, a British abolitionist, who uh, in 1791 responded to the discussion of the slave sugar boycott by asking the logical question, why there was no parallel mobilization against cotton? And Clarkson noted that the livelihood of the vast number of wage laborers in England depended upon its continued importation, whatever the source. Targeting cotton would have undermined the movement in all the town of Lancashire, a hardcore and slavery county. In France, after the second and final abolition of slavery in 1848, the color line continued to contaminate French thinking and progressive movement. Hubertine Auclair, a Republican feminist and advocate of women's suffrage and a staunch opponent of Napoleon III, wrote that the right to vote given to freedmen in 1848, whom she called savage Negroes, for, was an insult to the white race. Why were former slaves who were ignorant and savage better treated than white women who were, she said, educated and civilized? We know that the same thing happened in the US. The conception of citizenship and rights was color, and post-slavery colonialism accentuated the global color line, dictating immigration policies and conditions in the workplace, and still racializing sexualities, cultural and social norms. The imagined community of white men was strengthened. Transnational in its reach, but nationalist in its outcomes, bolstering regime of border protection and national sovereignties. A distinction between, on the one hand, ruling, race and rule races, between races fit and not fit for self-government, and on the other hand, between white civilization and non-white civilization took hold. Marilyn Lake and Erina Reynolds have shown in their book, Drawing the Global Color Line, White Men's Country and the International Challenge to Racial Equality, how during the rage of empires, Western states, in spite of their divergent interests, found common ground in the racialization of the workforce and workplace throughout the world, and in a new reordering of the world between consumer and producer, between fit and unfit people. The disruption of local economy due, due to Western presence in 19th century, in the end of 19th century, allowed Western powers to organize the migration of a large number of indentured laborers from India and China and other colony, or from colony to colony. They were again, for the most part, men, and testimony has shown that the situation of women among them was very brutal. They were often shared by four or five men through their working condition, whereas as harsh as the men. Moving a rationalized workforce across continent with the aim of preserving and enhancing European economic interests and way of life, and in needs for new resources and goods, followed on in the step of the slave trade. Convention between European powers, use of the national maritime industry, gendering and rationalized sexuality, work, and housing. Transport conditions as well as living and working conditions were barely different from those of colonial slavery. For 1847 to 1862, for instance, 600,000 chi 600, Chinese were shipped to Cuba on American vessel. Sociologists Chandra Shekhar Bhatt estimated that about 6 million people had left India when the indentured system was abolished in 1938. And note 
that in the meantime, in the 20s and 30s, workers in the West were winning important victory in terms of working condition, whether in France, US, or England. The importation of Indian, Chinese, Vietnamese, and other colonized people in European colony as indenture changed the cartography of trade, labor, and race. The description also of local economy, famine, loss of land, the destruction of local industry, led to movement of migration again across the colonial empire, leading, for instance, to the establishment of Muslim community in many European colonies. In the white man's world, Bill Schwartz demonstrated that the colony, colonial society works through race, so did the metropole. Following decolonization and the return of colonizer to the metropole, the discourse of racial whiteness was brought back to European country. With the end of its colonial empire, Europe withdrew into itself and sought to reconstruct a European space as a fortress of Christian and humanitarian value. Independent colonies were busy establishing their sovereignty and building their economy, but soon it was clear that memory of colonial history do not simply vanish from social landscape, but appear unmasked as an expected moment. In France, memory of colonial slavery entered the public space in 1998 during the 150th anniversary of the abolition of slavery in the French colonies. The socialist government had chosen to celebrate French abolitionism and once again, the voice and action of the enslaved were forgotten. The official discourse was placatory, seeking to pacify the history of colonial slavery. But on May 23rd, 40,000 people claiming to be descendants of slaves marched through Paris to honor their ancestor. It was a turning point, and communists put forward the first proposal to recognize slave trade and slavery crime against humanity in the French National Assembly. In 1998, the government accepted to discuss a law recognizing the slave trade and slavery crime against humanity, and the law was voted on May 10, 2001, but the government had made very clear that the notion of reparation will not be discussed or will not appear in the final text. In 2006, the Shira government adopted the proposal to make May 10 the national day of the memories of slave trade, slavery, and the abolition. There have been some progress in the field of education, research, and culture, and also, of course, website and museum. We can also observe in France the emergence of a black consciousness, but it's a very divided movement. Connection between the economy of colonial slavery and colonialism with current social and economic difficulties in post-slavery society are barely made. Antillean and African often approach the question very differently. Some Antillean are claiming the identity of descendant of slave, while others reject it. Demand for financial reparation are dividing the communities. And relations between colonial slavery and contemporary form of slavery are very controversial. The notion of memory has led to two outcomes for now. On the one hand, commemoration, and therefore forgetting through commemoration. On the other hand, to remembering as a challenge to the official way of writing history. But there is a more preoccupying movement. Today in France, the memory of colonial slavery have become element of public commemoration, as I say. So the first movement, the recognition of slavery as a crime and the respect for the memory of the descendant of slave, has reached its goal to a certain extent. What is more preoccupying is the rewriting of colonial slavery by the government and academic. This rewriting belongs to the larger movement of seeking to humanize the inhuman condition. In other words, if the globalization enacted by colonial slavery was contemporary to the theory of universal peace, cosmopolitanism, and human rights, why might wonder how globalization, cosmopolitanism, and human rights dealt with the economy of slavery. The way in which colonial slavery is being narrated now as often is erasing the radical dimension of abolitionism, of the universalism of slave revolt of the Asian Revolution. A moralistic approach dominates public discourse. Somewhere, some bad people did very bad things. The linear narrative of progress forbids the inclusion of enslavement as a persi persisting feature. Slavery remains opaque, a peculiar institution, and in existence is an anomaly, a paradox. Yet the slave is still the most radical figure of exploitation. It is the ultimate reference for representing bare life, the denial of rights, the body transformed into a commodity. When there is nothing left, the body can still be sold, wool, or piecemeal. 
to free slavery from a, to free slavery from a more moralistic approach, it to explore the politics and economy of predation, not as a remnant of a backward movement in the history of humanity, but as a form of exploitation that can be reinvented and is absolutely compatible with the existence of humanitarian discourse and technological progress. To maintain slavery as a register of abstract human rights is to mask the logic and practice of a system and the consequence of what Fa Franz Fanon called the voracity and bestiality of imperialism and the competition of between predators. In 2009, an anarchist slogan in the street of Paris sought to capture the illusion of trying to reform a system that needs the enslavement of some people to maintain its way. And I read, you know, what that was. If trade union had existed during slavery, they would have discussed the length of the chains. Whether we agree or not with this statement, I think that it pointed to the following question. To what extent does a contemporary inhuman condition rest on the distinction between human and inhuman conceived by the discourse of human rights, which allow those in power to hide the condition of life and work they have imposed? In his work on globalization, new cosmopolitanism, and human rights, Feng Shia has argued that since capitalist globalization is the context for human in the human world, capitalist globalization is also the context for human rights. She argues that human rights are violent gifts generated through a complex system of transnational institutional practices. Globalization, human rights, and the construction of the human are all closely related. The unwilling entanglement of laborers in the cycle of disfranchisement is perhaps the most significant negative impact of globalization for human rights. The difficulty to grasp all the facets of a system which yesterday, like today, presents a multiplicity of status, names, and live experience, and which has a formidable ability to transform itself, continues to raise an important question. Today, like yesterday, victims of trafficking and slavery are the most fragile and vulnerable members of society. As we know in Africa, it was, you know, mostly war prisoner or convict. But the poor, the vulnerable, are condemned to obscurity. We do not disapprove of them, we do not reproach them anything, but we do not see them. The life of the oppressed and the poor are deny existence. They are lives that do not matter. In conclusion, colonial slavery inaugurated a politic of race, power, and global division of labor that was able to go through new configuration. To assess, as a, you know, uh, the colloquium ask us, invite us to do, its legacy in contemporary scholarship on human trafficking in the study of colonial me cultural memories of historical traumas, one must challenge the view that it was a peculiar institution and worked through the long history of enslavement with colonial slavery establishing a global system. The approach that's, but at the same time, the approach that seeks to undermine the gravity of other form of slavery as what is called traditional slavery in Africa and Asia is wrong. Study of African and Asian form of slavery have shown that they were as brutal as colonial slavery. In Africa, the body of enslaved women were a vessel of reproduction, money of exchange, gift between powerful men. And the long practice of death slavery in Asia and Africa testifies that we must look at the history of the human body as capital, as commodity to traffic, exchange, and sell, but also as a story of the impulse to dominate and subjugate. Commerce, power, sex, and race are intimately connected in this matrix. Crossing the memory of enslavement, yesterday and today, will help rewrite the history of enslavement, challenging the anonymity produced by the category slave, which erases the singularity of the individual every time a woman, a man, a child, and showing that experience of the enslaved is everywhere an experience of dispossession, of despair, but also of hope and resilience. Finally, memories of slavery as social and cultural practice are rewriting history, bringing in the voice of the victim and witness, and questioning national and territorialized narratives, and showing the crossroads of enslavement and freedom. And we have, I will say, the duty to ask what are the relations between the first age of colonization, the age of empire, and current form of recolonization of the world, and the new policy of social engineering, displacing people, destroying cities to build new, new one, new form of urbanization, what is the relation between what's happening in Greece and the economy of predation? Should we do that connection? What kind of abolitionist movement can we build that connect the struggle against contemporary slavery and struggle against new form of predation? I leave us with this question. Thank you.
can you elaborate on sugar, femininity, and uh, tobacco and masculinity a little? Um, you, go, you, you prefer to take one? Of yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, no, many questions. No. So, you, you, yeah. Us, yeah. What do you take say? a few? No, that's yeah. as you wish. Go, go on. Just, just. Okay. Well, this is also, I mean, the, the question between tobacco and masculinity or sweet and, ma and femininity, it's also follow a work I've been doing at Le Louvre, because, you know, in France, a lot of people were telling me, we are not concerned with colonial slavery, our ancestors were not slave traders or slave owners and so on. I say, okay, fine and good, but your ancestors consume sugar and tobacco, okay? So, uh, where did they come from? And so, I suggested that we go through Le Louvre, and the, Louvre, the collection in the Louvre, we are gathered between 1793, the first abolition of slavery in the French colony in Saint-Domingue, and uh, the end in 1848, the final abolition of slavery. So it's perfect. Let's go through the Louvre and say, you know, because I call the program the, Slu the Slaves in the Louvre and Invisible Humanity. So I say, let's go. And I say to the Louvre, I don't want you to go through the collection and find two or three slaves with their chains, okay? No. I want to walk through the Louvre as a visitor today and, you know, where do, do we see, you know, on, which, on, on what whose label, you know, was built all this wealth. Of course, as you may guess, there are not that many. But so my point was, was to look more. When do we see the first men with a, with a pipe smoking? When do we see the first tobacco? When do we see the first woman dressed in cotton? When do we see the first uh, teapot? Uh, where do we see uh, all this you know, product, how, how colonial slavery contaminated the aesthetics and the art of living, the, you know, of Europe, without, of course, showing. It was necessary. I mean, you could not show the condition, of course, of, of work. And you have 17th century representation of plantation in Brazil or elsewhere, and they were pastoral. You see people, you know, I mean, working the land, but you don't, I mean, it's, it's not really, because in fact, the the kind of iconography that appear with chants and torture bodies more 19th century. Some appear in 18th century, some few, you know, with the abolitionist movement, but in the painting. So it was interesting to not to, um, to look at that way, so to, to, to introduce people to the way in which it has transformed their own society. Uh, because one of the challenge was to, to not, to, um, because when, when, the story of colonial slavery is accepted, it tends to say, okay, this belongs to the black people then, you know? This is the story of the black people. It's not our history. It's not the history of Europe. And so it's to say, yes, it's your history. Not in the same way, but it is your story. I mean, you will not have been what you are and who you are without that. So through that, through the question of art and painting, it was a way to enter that history. So not just, you know, the story of... Because if you show a French, uh, you know, um, plantation register, they say, okay, well, but it's over there, because like in England, France uh, put evil outside, over there, way over there, you know, um, it's not like the United State, it was under your eyes, so it's way over there, so it does not really, you know, it, it's really not us, it's, it's some, and you have that division between, you know, between the people, the French citizen and the colonizer, and the colonizers are not always very, very, I mean, true French, authentic French. You know, they got, they forgotten the what Frenchness. They went there, so the colony kind of contaminated them, and they became racist because a true French cannot be racist. May I ask the people who ask questions to introduce themselves, please? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for your talk. My name is Markus Balkenhol. I'm a research fellow at the uh, uh, Center for the Humanities. Um, and I wanted to draw attention again to a quote you gave from the King of France from, I think, 1310? 1315. 1350, sorry. Um, where he says that once the enslaved uh, touch the French soil, they, be, they become free. And I, especially in the context of this conference, I find this link between the soil and freedom really interesting um, yeah. as a kind of almost a contagious kind of magic. Um, and I was wondering um, what your thoughts are on, on this link of freedom and unfreedom um, as it is connected to the, to the soil even today. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you think of um, uh, things like Fortress Europe or, mm -hmm. you know, the various fences and walls that are going up um, all over the world. I just um, mm. wanted to yeah. ask you to um, give your thoughts on that. 
Very Thank good you. question. Thank you. Um, well, that principle was, was a progressive principle, then it was not through blood that you would become free, right? So, but what we don't see, the other, that it was constructed upon, the, you know, ex excluding black people from that soil. So there is a, uh, as, as quite often is contradictory, bring, you know, new contradictions. So on the one hand, it, it makes, so there is no longer, slavery can no longer exist in France, but that means that some people will be enslaved, and since they have to be distinguished, they have to become black. I mean, black, blackness then become a color. And um, what I wanted to do is to, to say through that, to say to the French that there is a history of whiteness in France. And, and we have to look through that history of whiteness. And if it is how you construct, I mean, the long history, in fact, uh, that whiteness did not start with post-colonial uh, migration to Europe, you know, in the, uh, in the 1960, after the independence. But as a long history, in fact, uh, really grounded with slave trade and, and slavery, colonial slavery that we are discussing uh, for the, during these two days. It started then, it started then. So you have the laws in the colony, that have been nonetheless, you know, uh, discussed because quite early, also. and but you have the laws in the, in France proper, and they are quite often forgotten, and we don't want to see the connection between both. And I do think that this idea that also the Treaty of Utrecht, as I, you know, quoted some of the of the word um, that it used, you know, of, of um, being um, united by a single religion. Uh, the same in law, morals, literature, commerce, and a sort of equilibrium constructed both at the same time put an end to the religious war, and that was good. But it's a constant double thing that building a land of the free, so you will have a world of the unfree, and they will be rationalized. I'm not sure. And today, I think, for instance, all the discussion or everywhere, the xenophobic uh, rhetoric that has been, and racist rhetoric that we see emerging everywhere in Europe is absolutely. Um, an attempt to, to rebuild uh, a, a white uh, and Christian Europe, even though it's, it's, it's over. It will never be that, but there is, there is this idea. Um, it's very interesting to follow what's happening in Brussels uh, around that. I've been following that. It's very interesting, uh, the way, and the way, uh, the, the role of the, what we used to call Eastern Europe in that. But that's not the discussion. Thank you very much for your lecture. I have a question. Uh, I was very convinced by what, by your argument, what I would myself call the pacification of slavery. That's all placed in the past and not uh, uh, connected to present conditions. But uh, a few years ago, we had here in Utrecht as a guest, Anne-Laura Stoller, and she used the concept of colonial aphasia. And I take it to mean that there are no frames within uh, Europe, I know this from France, but I, I see it myself in the Netherlands. I know people in Portugal, uh, work in Portugal, who say the same thing uh, about there. Uh, there are no frames in which uh, colonial past and past of slavery are meaningful within, uh, uh, with, uh, for uh, many people in Europe. I was wondering if, what you think of this argument. Please introduce yourself. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. My name is Paul Bell, and I'm from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, well, thank you. Um, you want to take another question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think she's right and she's wrong. <laughs> um, I think sometimes it's, it's a little superficial to say that there is, you know, a, 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 a cultural aphasia. It's very, very alive in many, many groups. Even, you know, among, you know, colonizers who came back. If we take France, the Pied Noir or the Archi or people from uh, New Caledonia. And so it's, it's more interesting to look at the way in which when this memory enters the public space or I recognize and the kind of a, a competition between these different memories and the way in which the government is managing these different memories and putting them in, you know, uh, against each other. Uh, I, I did this work. Um, I don't know, two years ago. And, um, and I saw that, you know, even the colonial story is written chapter by chapter or territory by territory. So what happened in Algeria happened in Algeria, what happened in New Caledonia, and no looking at, you know, the connection. And uh, so I, I suggested this work called Cross Memories and Crossing the Memory, you know, among colonies. How what happened in Madagascar has an impact of what happened in Africa. In, in fact, the policy of forced labor were first experienced in Madagascar, and Galieni and Lyote, who became 
governor, colonial governor, one in Morocco and the other, in, you know, brought with them. So this kind of work, this can also, or, or the fact that French society today is the result of this long history of colonization. If you are a French citizen today who are descendant of slaves, Kanak, uh, you know, Amerindian, descendant of Maroons, Arki, Pienoir, whatever, it's, it's because France produced them, this long history. So if we start from today and pull the thread to understand why they are there, then you have. So I will not say, I mean, the, the, it's, more, uh, it's more the approach by chapters and, and territory that I will question, you know, that's still going on. Uh, one of the things I was just uh, talking with Sadie about that, for instance, in France, you do slavery, the end of slavery, and post-colonial slavery colonization start. I say, no, Algeria, 1830, is already a French colony. Slavery is abolished 18 years later. 18 years is quite a long time in political, you know. Work. So what's happening when, you know, Al Algeria is already a colony, and there is still, how this, you know, cross each other? So it, it's more like uh, denationalizing and territorializing this history, rather. Good morning. Uh, my name is Francia Guadalupe of the University of Amsterdam. Um, I have a question, because you mentioned, and it's an empirical question, you said there might be some differences between how French Antillians want to deal with the question of slavery and how persons of Africa want to deal with it. And I'm questioning also persons of Sub-Saharan and North African descent. How is this um, going about in France? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, well, for the Antillian, I mean, in the anti itself, uh, the, the memory of colonial slavery are, are taken by a lot of the people who are, you know, very uh, active, were former nationalists, uh, who, you know, went against so much resistance, you know, French said they abandoned the idea of independence and they have invested the field of, of memory. It's very important for them to push forward that identity as descendant of slave. They are descendant of slave. And so, therefore, they have the legitimacy to speak about slavery. The African were the one who sold them into slavery, or the ancestors. So the African have nothing to say about slavery, and they cannot share that identity. It's also, I will say, you know, uh, again, perhaps in my answer before, the way the government is managing memories now push people to uh, defend a territory, I mean, an identity that they have, you know, I am a descendant of slave now, so don't enter my territory unless you show your visa, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, whatever, whatever. So cro crossing, wh what is the, the connection between that history and other history is, is almost cut because um, when I say the management, the political management, but also in, in very concrete ways, for instance, you have some cities who will build a, a monument for that group and not for that one. So that one will say why, you know, and so on and so forth. So um, that one thing, and also, because in France, being black is not so much accepted as an identity. Um, don't forget that uh, the French policy of assimilation has been quite uh, effective. And a lot of Antillians will say they are French first. And uh, if I may just say an anecdote, you know Arlem Desir, who is the general secretary of the Socialist Party today, and his uh, father was from Martinique. And he was invited by African American who says, so wh you know, what is the experience of being black in France? And he said, I'm not black, I'm French. So they, they, they look at him and say, okay, <laughs> okay. But so it's, uh, I mean, we have to observe that in France. We have really to be careful about not, you know, uh, um, putting, you know, what can happen in England or in the United States or perhaps even in Germany because they are also, I mean, you have transnational movement and the impact of transnational identity, but you do have also local historical context that still have a weight, you know, still imprint. And the Sub-Saharan North African, you have a group in France now who are, who is asking, which is asking the North African uh, to recognize 
their role in slave trade. And they have been received by people, you know, by the ambassador of Morocco. So there is a movement toward that. And you have new also in Ethiopia last year for the first time, you, have, uh, you had talk about uh, slavery in Ethiopia. Uh, you have a movement moving on. There is, uh, in East Africa, I mean, the, the whole in the slave trade, because we have to distinguish in Africa slave trade with slavery, with local form of slavery. Uh, in, in, in colonial slavery, I mean, Africa is connected through the slave trade, but not through slavery. And so you have to distinguish that. Um, I will say that it's also, uh, perhaps, it, it, what I try to argue that we need really to reconsider colonial slavery outside of the moralistic frame that it was bad, but to bring, you know, what it was at one, what, and what is today, you know, and in which way it, there is a continuous uh, need for that part of bonded labor in the production of goods we need every day. Thank you. Maybe the last question, unless there are other registrations, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Olivier Kramsch, I am from the Nijmegen Center for Border Research. Uh, in the Department of Human Geography, Radboud University, in the eastern periphery of this country, Nijmegen. Uh, where we are also struggling to uh, inject post-colonialism and post-colonial studies in our uh, geography curriculum. So, a motion of support from Nijmegen to the earlier comments. Uh, Madame Vergès, it is an honor to address you this morning. As a border scholar, I was taken by the phrase global border that you mentioned in your talk. Uh, and I, I'd like us to think together about how this global border, this global European border, might function. Because I sense that part of your story, this border involves not just a colonial frontier, Europe expanding ever outwards into the colonial sphere, but also with the story of your um, uh, African migrants in Paris, there's an internal border at stake. And there might be an interesting interplay between the internal border and the external border of Europe uh, that is being negotiated mm -hmm. in this uh, process. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'd like to uh, reflect on, on these border dynamics also, not just historically, but also in the context of uh, work that you've done, which I'm fascinated with uh, regarding the um, reflect the, 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 the troubled and tumultuous social movements in the former uh, French colonies, in the Antilles in particular, in Guadeloupe, in Martinique, uh, Guillaume Francaise, and in Réunion, where we see popular referenda in the last one or two or three years, um, rejecting uh, autonomy from France. Uh, local elites supporting, but the mass of the population rejecting this autonomy. And I sense that there is a border at stake. There is a border work is going on here in the, um, the Département Outre-mer uh, that I think is important in helping to redefine uh, the very identity of the French Republic. Merci. Yeah, that's, I, I, I will say that it's it, very important to uh, examine the post-colonial reality, the French post-colonial reality. It's, I mean, I know that we always say that England has also uh, territories overseas, but France is really the only country in Europe which has so many, so many overseas territories populated by so many people in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, in North America, in South America, in the Indian Ocean. And, you know, and, and what Take, you know, bring them together. What is, you know, what is common? What is the common history? So it is true that through uh, French uh, citizenship, they uh, have European citizenship. And that gives them a lot of privilege in terms of uh, traveling, for instance, or moving around. They don't need visa in their region, whereas, for instance, in Martinique, people from uh, someone from Jamaica to enter Martinique will need a visa because we are not in the Schengen uh, uh, Area, you know, all this overseas territory. So there is, there is. Uh, uh, I mean, the Fr the French had bought <laughs> out the people of this territory, giving them some privilege, but then um, this privilege will go with dependency. Uh, and if I, but I mean, this is not really the place, but. I have to say also that in the, in the 1960s, 1970s, there was a very strong movement, very strong movement for autonomy in this territory, and it was violently repressed by the French state. And people were really starting to, to be afraid, afraid of losing uh, 
Uh, people, I mean, there was, you know, people were put in jail, were, you know, expelled, uh, you know, uh, lost their jobs. Uh, and it affected, these are very small society, it affected a lot of people. So all this, you know, it, it's, uh, it's uh, really, I, I think France, Republican or not, is really uh, the civilizing mission as, as really, um, is really widely shared. It's, of course, nobody will use that expression anymore. Left and right uh, among the colonized the former colonizer and the colonizer. Uh, it's, and so that's a post-coloniality that is, uh, is really peculiar. Um, what will happen, you do have social movement, as you know, there is a lot of in unrest in all this overseas territory. Uh, just one thing, and uh, if I may. Some years ago, I, I, I was uh, involved, I mean, I was asked to work on a museum in La Réunion, in Réunion Island. And it was uh, the history of the population of the society. And there have been a report, I mean, done by some French uh, scholars. And they started the history of the population when the French arrived and colonized the island. And as you may know, there was no native population in Réunion nor in Mauritius. So the, the story started then, and we went along through the First Republic, the Second Republic, the Third Republic, blah, 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 until now. So everything that was happening in France, what was happening in Réunion, da, da, da. And I suggested that, you know, Réunion was, is on the African-Asian axis, is in the Indian Ocean, within the million, millionary space of exchange and, and uh, encounters between Africa and Asia for, you know, fifth century. Uh, so what was, you know, the French were the late, a late actor, like all the other European power, they arrived in, uh, you know, uh, uh, 15th century. So, when you are in the Indian Ocean, Europe is really on the periphery, geographically and historically. So it was more important to start with the Indian Ocean world. It was also to, to, to insist on the fact that the enslaved people from Madagascar or from East Africa or the indenture worker from India and China did not come from empty space and places. They were not on the shores waiting for you know, the European to take them as captive. They came from very complex society and, and, and culture and social organization, which had had contact with each other, had had kingdom, kingdom fell, wars, I mean, I mean, you know, dynamic history. So we had to be, to put ourselves in that history because even today, and today, we are in the Indian Ocean. And the Indian Ocean today is again, you know, a space of incredible exchange, the presence of China, the, the power of India, the new form of human trafficking in this region, the new form of enslavement, the new form of colonization. So if we think that we are just a little piece of metropolitan France, no future. Um, I cannot refuse him the microphone to Hirsch Dostindi, you asked for it. Um. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gertor um, uh, <clears throat> I would just like to make uh, one, one more remark about what you said about uh, why people in the French Département d'Outre-mer would not want independence, would rather stick with, the, uh, with France. Um, <clears throat> there's a larger story to that, of course. Uh, if you look today around the world, as sometimes people talk about the confetti of empire, uh, non-sovereign entities once colonized, there, all those remaining entities tend to be very small scale, islands and so on and so forth. Always, they will. I mean, great majorities within these populations will refuse independence uh, for a mixture of basically pragmatic reasons: um, economic advantages, political advantages, the migratory advantages, and so. And then, sort of like they have to sort out what they, they then will, how they will think of themselves culturally, whether French or not, and so on and so forth. That, that, and that's all over the place. That's in the Pacific, that's in the Indian Ocean, that's in the, in the Caribbean. There's one interesting contrast if you look at the metropolitan countries, how they deal with that. And there I see a major contrast between France and the Netherlands, for example. Right. <coughs> Whereas if you look, for example, in the Caribbean, you have, of course, also the US with Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands. Um, the US and France want to remain in these places also for strategic reasons, mm -hmm. but then France has this additional reason. France has this idea of grandeur, some of clinging on to the past and so being all over the world, being a proud country. Whereas, for example, if you look at the UK or you look at the Netherlands, mm -hmm. basically they're only there because they could not find a way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, remember that France had the most brutal colonial war of decolonization 
in, you know, in Madagascar, in the China, Cameroon, I mean, the, the Algeria, the list is very, very long, very, very long. So there is effectively the geo geopolitical uh, interest. I mean, it gives them, uh, they are the third maritime power, you know, internationally, thanks to this place. So it means also money, revenue. Uh, it's also um, a, a culturally, I mean, an idea of, uh, you know, being still uh, francophony uh, in the world. And um, there, were, there was a, all these things uh, together, definitely, the difficulty to renounce that the fact that the French colonization was not as brutal the, as the other, because it had with itself the desire to bring human rights and French human rights to the world. And that would mean to give up, to give up that. And what I talk, for instance, when I quote Hubertine Auclair, is one among others, when I say that in front, it's almost people refuse to hear that. No, our movement, our social movement could not be racist. So when you bring even the 1970s, when you know, uh, migrant workers from North Africa had to fight in the union trade, you know, in the CGT and so on, to get their rights, to be listened at their condition, uh, working and living conditions were not the same as the worker, it was also difficult. And to this day, it's difficult. I mean, there is old things, you know, about a Muslim in France, as you do know, and the incredible controversy about the veil, which is, in fact, you know, uh, just a, a scarf, uh, and which divided deeply the feminist movement, and to this day, and divided the left, even uh, the, the Trotskyists, you know, they, they imploded because of that question. Uh, it's very, so I think, yes, there is a, a, a need for the French progressive movement to, uh, and the other, I mean, to French society. But I will not say it's not just France. Europe has to go through a process of decolonization. It's on decolonization. It's on decolonization. So not the, all the people will take care of the decolonization and go through, you know, what they have to go through. But how Europe will decolonize itself, and I think, for instance, the Treaty of Utrecht is a very interesting uh, moment to, 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 to look at that construction of Europe as one, as a regional power with, with common interests and common values and how it constructs itself against uh, the world and how this is being reconstructed. So yes, going through a decolonization uh, movement.